Welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Mike Hornby. I am joined by my co-host, Delegate Mike Height. Good morning, sir. Good to be here. Good morning. New York Times award-winning, best-selling, I mean, we give you everything, author. That's working for me. Movie writer, <clears throat> screenwriter, John Gilstrap. Good morning. How are you, sir? It's got well. like 70 or 80 books now. Somebody needs to go. Just, how many I books just, is it? I just, I just finished writing 29. 29. Number 29, yes. And how many movies have actually been made? None. How many scripts have been sold? Um, I have I have written and sold four. Okay. Okay. And and then four more have been written of mine. So Are a total of, of eight movie projects, and none of them have made it to the screen. <laughs> uh, any of them, the Jonathan Grave uh, series? I just I just picked up an option for the Grave series, but nothing. It hasn't advanced. Okay. So very well. Very nice. We are joined via phone from Milwaukee, uh, Larry Pack, Secretary of Revenue of West Virginia. Larry, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Good morning, guys. How is everyone? Doing good. How are you? Good, good. We're just having a fantastic time in Milwaukee. Uh, West Virginia delegation is uh, is excited and just, uh, uh, enjoying the, uh, the the festivities and enjoying bar being uh, part of history. Uh, the history to bring uh, President uh, President Trump back to the to the White House. So, so uh, we, yeah. we we've obviously been watching in the evenings. What happens during the day? That, that you know, we we see what goes on on the floor in the evening. But what happens during the day? You go, guys, all just sleeping. The there, there, there's lunch, lunches and breakfasts and just different forums where you can uh, hear the the various conservative leaders from around the country uh, speak and share their ideas and share their directions for the company, uh, for the country. So we, we've been doing a lot of a lot of that, and and so we've just been able to really kind of uh, rub shoulders with again conservatives from all over the country different types of conservatives. You know, the Republican Party is, is a big tent party, uh, but hearing these ideas is, is really been a blessing. And what I really uh, have enjoyed um, probably more than anything, and it's probably an age thing with me, is, is the young conservatives and the ideas that they're bringing to our party and the excitement uh, that they have for, for our country. Uh, uh, we're, we're um, this young generation is going to is going to lead our lead our country, I think, in really really positive uh, directions, and I'm just very excited to see uh, to see what they do. With all the cheering and stuff that goes on there, is it hard to hear what the speakers are saying? If you're on the floor, and I go back and forth, uh, so so we've got, we've got the, you know 32 delegates, and then we got 32 alternates. The delegates are on the floor, and if you notice on the floor there just to the uh, right of the, um, uh, if, you're on the, if you're on the stage, just to the right of the stage, so we're right in front. It is really hard to hear if you're on the floor. Um, uh, you got photographers, photographers and news people going this way and that way. Uh, it's hard to, but it's, that's where the most excitement is because you'll see uh, this senator and that senator walk by, and, and, and so that's, that's the fun part, or, or this uh, um a guy from CNN or Fox or whatever going through. So it's really, it's a lot of fun down there. So uh, you can feel the excitement. Now, when you go up and sit where the alternates are, which would be on what we think is is the lower level uh, in an arena, which are still great seats, you can really hear very well um, the speakers there. It's, it's, it's a lot, a lot easier to, to, to listen to them. So I, I kind of like both. Uh, but, but I know tonight when the president speaks, I'm uh, I'm a little bit torn as to whether to go upstairs and listen to him or to stay on the floor and just being right in the middle of the madness because I think that riff might blow off that arena when he walks in. So, so Larry, how did West Virginia get front row right there? It, is it like is it drawn seating or how did West Virginia no, get right up front? It, it, Negotiation, so it's it's a, it's a little bit our delegation. I think I, I know our chairman Matt Harris worked worked on it, and I know our, our governor elect or our nominee uh, Patrick Morrissey worked on it. I, maybe I had a teeny piece of it. I think um, uh, we're we're just uh, President Trump likes West Virginia. He understands West Virginia. He understands what we're for. He knows that we were either number one or number two as far as supporting him. So, so I think all that really uh, really helps us a lot, but. Uh, uh, and again, I didn't mean to ex exclude Governor Justice. I know Governor, Governor Justice weighed in as well. So, uh, for whatever reason, that's, we're, we're front we're front row. Um, the only other time I've seen that was in 2004, uh, the uh, second convention for uh, President Bush. Uh, and as, as uh, 
you guys might remember President Bush really liked West Virginia because we put him over the top in 2000 in a way that people just didn't think would happen. So, so he had us to the front, uh, I think it was front right, um, on, uh, in, in New York. So it's a great, uh, great place to be. Um, it's, it's just amazing that when, when Governor Justice was there the other night, um, uh, and he Governor spoke. Justice and Baby Dog actually spoke. And Baby Dog. Yeah. And Baby Dog. And Baby Dog. Yeah. So after they spoke, and I thought they represented West Virginia really, really well. Uh, so he put a sales pitch in for West Virginia, talked about his relationship for, with President Trump, and then why President Trump is not only good for West Virginia, good for the country. But then he came downstairs, and when he came downstairs, and, and he said in our delegation, since it was at the front, there were photographers and cameras from all around the world, and uh, um I think if he was still sitting there, they'd still be taking pictures and still asking questions. So we all enjoyed that, uh, being able to participate in that. And of course, I'm sure he's seen a lot of a lot of pictures. I think the, uh, Baby Dog would definitely stole the show on uh, on the, on that particular day. So uh, uh, great, great uh, press, press and, and uh, for West West Virginia. But it, being in the front like that is uh, it's exciting because everybody that anybody's going to walk by at some point in time. And so a lot of our folks have. I've been getting pictures, pictures with 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 the various folks. Uh, they're getting interviewed a lot. Um, uh, one of our delegates was 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 on Fox News the other day. Uh, West Perry, uh, who's up in the northern Panhandle, I think he's been interviewed a dozen times by different people. Uh, so we're getting a lot of press and a lot of interaction with the press to be able to tell uh, West Virginia's story and also tell why why President Trump is so important for West Virginia and so important for the country. Mr. Secretary, is this your first convention, or have you been to some before? This is my first. Well, uh, this is my second convention as a delegate. Uh, but the first convention as a, as a delegate, um, and I'm also you know national committeeman, uh, was in Charlotte. Uh, but that was like going to a wake. Charlotte during during COVID. <laughs> uh, between the state of North Carolina and the city of Charlotte, they locked us down. They would only allow us, I think, 250 people in a room. Uh, it was like going to a wake, wow. um, and you know we had to be thirty foot apart, all kind of really ridiculous type stuff. Uh, no, there's no audience. It was just it was just the just the delegates that were would vote, uh, and they really scaled that back. Uh, so, uh, and then the, previously, I'd, I'd been a visitor a couple times, uh, but this is uh, my first time, my wife's first time to be able to come um, as a delegate, as representing West Virginia, being part of our delegation, and it's been such a blessing. Uh, so exciting uh, to be in in the hall. Uh, it's such a historic event uh, with friends and, and from all around the country who are unified in retiring President Biden and unified in bringing President Trump back to the White House. Well, Mr. Secretary, let's get into sort of the the, the meat and potatoes here. So. Um, the the governor has come out here recently and uh, indicated he would like to see an additional 5% tax cut uh, for the state of West Virginia. And you're the revenue secretary. Um, so what is your take on that? Do you do you foresee us having the revenue to to do this uh, with without any issues? Well, we do. Uh, you know, per- President, actually, Governor Justice is, um, you know, he's always a big thinker and big swinger, and he, he knows um, how difficult it is to pass substantial, uh, substantial tax cuts. Uh, we've done a lot of little tax cuts, but, you know, we did the big one last year of over $800 million, um, um, uh, and it was tough. It was really hard to get last year's uh, tax cut through. Uh, but we got it through. We're very thankful for the legislature for working on it. Didn't get everything we wanted, because if you can remember, Governor Justice won 50%. Uh, House went along with it. We couldn't quite get the Senate there, and, and so we got what we got. Um, as part of that, uh, we got a trigger um, that basically what the trigger does is once a year we do this calculation, and, and if the revenues for West Virginia, for state West Virginia, grow faster than the rate of inflation, then uh, taxpayers get a get a get an additional tax cut. So so that happened this year. We announced last week that there will be an additional four percent decrease and personal income tax rates effective January 1 uh, to 2025. But we also believe, and the governor believes strongly, that, that we could go further faster, and, and that's where he came up with this additional 5%. And so uh, we, we had looked at the numbers a little bit before we came up with that, of course, and, and so we feel pretty good about it. Um, what we're doing now uh, at the request of the legislature, request of the governor, is we're going back and rechecking our numbers um, 
both on the revenue side and the expense side. And, and putting all that together is probably going to take us another week or so. And then we're going to come and talk to both the House and the Senate, uh, answer all their questions. We've been taking questions and, and so forth and researching the different things they have. So long story short, we think we have the money. We think we can do it. And again, what we're at, what the governor's asking for is additional 5%, which is about $115 million. So that's $115 million out of a almost $6 billion uh, revenue. So it's less than 2%, but it's one and a half. I don't have the math in front of me. So it's, it's not much. It may require us to uh, tighten our belt a little bit. It may uh, um, require us to uh, uh, evaluate different projects and different things we're spending on. Uh, but we think that the, the citizens deserve uh, to keep more of their money. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the state government uh, tightening their belt a little bit. And remind us again, what was the final surplus we we uh, achieved? The final surplus for the year was was uh, about eight. I think it was about eight hundred twenty-seven million dollars. And that means over the last four years, we've had surpluses of about four billion dollars, which is quite quite extraordinary. So, what do you say to those individuals who argue that uh, we still haven't addressed all of the needs uh, within the state, with uh, like CPS workers needing raises, teachers still need more money, um, the IDD waiver, direct care workers uh, shortage? Uh, so, there's there's obviously still needs within the state uh, that need to be uh, rectified. Is there revenue for both? Do we have the revenue to, to take care of all those issues uh, that people are still talking about and to give this tax cut? Yes, we, 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 uh, we think so. Um, and again, that's some of the research we're putting together. But, but sometimes what, what, what happens under the dome a lot of times is people see a need, and it can be a really relevant need. Um, and they say, well, we need another 10 for this, 10 million for this, or 15 million for that. But what we don't do very well under the dome is look for things that we maybe we shouldn't be doing, uh, things that maybe um, government doesn't have to do, or a program that started 50 years ago that's not necessarily um, really necessary. So, and I think I think DHHR is, is one of those things. You know, we, over there they've got about a six billion dollar budget, and they're you know CPS workers and IDD waiver. Those those are serious things that that need attention. Uh, but maybe there's some things in there that uh, that we could cut back on a little bit. Uh, as you as you may have noticed last week, um, uh, the Department of Health Facilities announced uh, that they are in the process of selling the state nursing homes. We think that's going to create not only better care uh, for our citizens, uh, not only uh, new facilities for um, uh, the communities that they're in, tax paying facilities because these private facilities will be on the tax rolls. But also, it will save the state money on the general, on, on their budget. So we 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 think there's opportunities to to find that money within those department budgets. Uh, but at the same time, we're willing to add some additional money uh, to those budgets uh, as well. But what we can't do is every time we find a need, even if it's a good need, we can't automatically say we need to throw more money at government. We need to stop, stop and pause and see if there's some places we can save some money. I think also particularly when it comes to the Eastern Panhandle uh, situations, because your needs are different than any other place in, in our state, is this one-size-fits-all thing that comes out of Charleston that says we've got to pay everybody the same, whether they're in, um, um, I'll pick on Canal County, I'm Canal County, uh, whether in Canal County, uh, Morgantown, or Martinsburg, is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I was in business for, for, for 40 years, and we had offices and, and operations all around the state of West Virginia. And we had different pay scales for each market because each market was a different market. We need to recognize that under the dome that, that one size fits all doesn't work in Washington and it doesn't work in Charleston. Either. So what you're advocating for is locality pay. So how do we get the rest no, of the state? I don't know. I don't know. This, I don't know. This locality, locality pay. I think it's what it was. What, what I. What I would call it more is we need to give the agencies the flexibility to pay what they need to pay in the markets they're in. So the new locality, maybe that is the definition of it. But you, but you need flexibility. You got to get away from this one size fits all. That, that's our. That's I think one of our big problems with, with teachers. Um, so, so you know, we all know that the market cost of living in the Eastern Panhandle is higher. Uh, than it is in southern West Virginia. We can't pay everybody the same. Um, but I'm pretty, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, this is my, 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 my opinion is a little different on the governor. Uh, 
I just think that at some point we've got to give these board of education, these local board of education, the flexibility to take the money the state sends them to spend it how they think is best, and where they think that is best. We we got to we got to we got to get away from one size fits all, and uh, that's something I advocate as treasurer. Something I've advocated that. Uh, when I was in the House, I've advocated it in the governor's office, and I'll continue to advocate that to give each each area the flexibility to do things they have to do to provide the services that we ask them to provide. So last year, the, y'all were touting the 21%, I think, whatever the number was, uh, income tax, state income tax cut. And since then, we've been talking about percentages of percentages, and I get lost in the numbers. So if the the 4% plus the governor's pr- uh, proposed 5% tax cut comes through. If we dial it back, we, we can say that we, the state has reduced the state income tax by a total of what? 30%. 30%. Okay. Is that correct, Larry? Yeah, we're trying to get close to 30%. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's a big number. That's a giant number. It is. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, it is, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I mean, it's something to celebrate it. I mean, it's hard. You, you, I mean, you guys in the house, it's hard to pass a tax cut, a big tax cut, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we need to celebrate that. Again, what the governor is, the governor is basically, he's saying, hey, first of all, the taxpayers deserve as much money as we can give them, right? But second of all, we live in a competitive country. And when you look at the, at the income tax rates around our our state, if you look at the other states, with the exception of Maryland, uh, we're we're higher. In some cases, much higher. So we want to be c- competitive first uh, to our surrounding states, and, s- and then then second, we want to continue to move towards zero on personal income tax. With, and zero is a much bigger deal. It's going to take some strategic and structural changes, but we can get competitive. We think with the scheme that we currently have, governor's just trying to get us there further, faster. And are so, we breaking our own rules by doing this at all? Are we still obeying the triggers and, and all of those? The triggers still stay in place. This is just an addition. Yeah, the triggers will stay in place. I don't. But, but know, are I don't, we vi- is this a one-time violation, or is this in compliance with what was established before? Well, the, the, there's no violation. Of, uh, the only way to be a violation is tax department would do it without the consent of the legislature, which would never do. Um, you guys be after me, but but no, it, there, there's there was, you know, one legislature can't you know hold the hands of uh, or tie the hands of the next legislature. Right. So that's why we're coming back to you. So there is no, um, there's no plan that we're going to do this, do what we did last year and never touch it again. I never heard that conversation, and not that the conversation didn't happen, but I was never in that. It was this is the best deal that we could get in 2023. That's the deal we got. That's what the governor signed. The legislature went away, away with. Now it's 2024. Our economic conditions have changed. Uh, West Virginia's economy through the through the diversification uh, that's happened through all the great things that the legislature and governor's done over the last eight years. Our, our economy's much better. We have more tax revenues. We think we can move it up, and we're trying to make. We're currently making the case. We're preparing to make the case to the legislature as to why we think we can do it. Now it's up to us to make the case to answer every question the legislature has. And we'll do that. We have been doing that. Um, I called this morning to somebody in leadership. We're going to do something next week. But we'll continue to put our information together, be very transparent uh, with the legislature to try to, as much as we can, to convince them this is a good thing. And it has to be a good thing, not just now. It's got to be a good thing long term. So we're very, you know, we're very cognizant of, uh, as the governor says, we don't want to to shoot our legs off. Uh, but also we're conservative, and so we want to make sure that our government can continue providing the services that um, our citizens need. Um, so we want to do that. We want to put, and Governor told me, told me over and over, we want to do everything we can to make sure that when Governor Morrissey takes office next January, that West Virginia is fiscally solvent. Uh, and we talked to you know Governor Morsi about or Governor Black, whatever he's talking with Morsi about that. So so we're we're not going to try to. Spend it all. We're not going. We're not trying to put West Virginia in a bad position. We're trying to make West Virginia competitive, and at the same time, give people more of their money. So but again, so, so Larry, can you explain a little bit about the reserve account that, that the governor was talking about? Can you give us a little more detail on that? Well, that's you know one of the one of the great stories of uh, I think West Virginia the last eight years, and I'll get my numbers off a little bit, but 
when when Governor Justice was elected, I think we had about five hundred million dollars in a rainy day fund. That that now sits at about one point two billion dollars. In addition to that one point two billion dollars, we have over five hundred million dollars in what we call a per, PI personal income tax reserve fund, just sitting there, five hundred million dollars. And the and the idea upon that is is when we passed that tax cut last year, that if we went too far, which we didn't think we did, we would have some money to bridge it. For, the, for a few years until uh, our growth ca- growth and revenue caught up uh, with with the budget. We haven't needed any of that money. I think that money that's, so, so it's, I think it's $560 million. What the governor is saying is, hey, if you don't think that $1.2 billion is enough, and you don't think that $560 million is enough, let's put some more money in the PIT reserve fund. Let's put another couple hundred million dollars in if that's what it takes to make the legislature comfortable. Uh, and he's willing. He's willing, willing to uh, to do that to advocate that. I don't really think it's necessary, uh, but it's an option, and it's an option that we'll discuss with the with the legislature. If that's something the legislature wants to do, uh, we'll we'll go on with. But that that's the conservatism. That's hey, let's be doubly, triply, triple sure. Uh, that's what we're trying to, to to make sure that everybody's really really comfortable uh, with doing this because we want. Uh, we want everybody to come together on this. We want, um, uh, you know, we want as much as possible everybody to agree to it. Uh, and something we can all celebrate, get back on a stage somewhere and celebrate that we have input taxpayers um, in front of the, uh, the swamp in Charleston. And, the, and those reserve funds are accessible if needed, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, 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 yes. Yeah, the, the, the Revenue Secretary has the um, authority to pay tax refunds out of that reserve fund. So, so for example, if I would deem that we needed it to pay our, reserve, pay our refunds, uh, I could use that fund. Uh, if not, they just come out of the general fund. We haven't needed it. We haven't came close to needing it. And it's just sitting there. And I, I really think that part of that reserve fund, uh, the origi- where it originated, I really came, I think, from a chairman householder. I think Eric uh, mm-hmm. had a lot to do with coming up with that idea. And, uh, of course, we jumped all over it once he brought it up. And how much has that reserve fund grown? Because um, obviously uh, the it's, not, it's not just it sitting in a savings goes, account. Right? It, it goes, the interest that it earns goes back to the general fund. So that reserve fund that itself doesn't, doesn't increase, unlike the uh, rainy day fund. But it's, it's actually generating revenue and yeah, interest, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it generates interest. And, and through the um, Treasurer's Office and the Bureau of, of Treasury Investments, which, you know, Riley Moore is, is the one now, and hopefully I'll be doing next January. Yeah, that's made, they're making really good returns there. And again, it gets all back in the general fund. If you look at the budget last year, we had in excess of $100 million in interest income uh, that uh, really I think it's close to $200 million that West Virginia uh, earned on its investments through BTI and Treasurer Moore's efforts. You, you say hopefully doing next year. Do you have an opponent in the general? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you are the so presumptive you, yeah. nominee. Then. So you will be <laughs> doing next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're not supposed to, you know, chicken square the hatch, I guess. But, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I'm never sure exactly how to refer to my, my situation. It's kind of kind of unique, and it def- definitely wasn't expected. I guess I need to ask Charlie Trump. He's attacking him a whole bunch of times. So, Larry, we got about 60 out. seconds left. How, yes, how much are you working with the presumptive next governor at this stage uh, and how much does the governor the Marcy and, and justice work together now uh, well they, they they talk all the time of course I'm not in those conversations but they, they talk all the time I'm, I've been hanging out with Patrick all week uh, what we've told Patrick is that we'll give him any ma- information he wants when he wants it so I've kept him up on on, on some of the bigger things that talks to him about the tax situation um, and um, and basically some other things I think it's important for him to know. Uh, he he's basically telling us that he thinks that he'll turn uh, to uh, the transition in, in August. What what uh, what the governor justice has said is for us to do everything we can to to make make it not only a smooth transition but a successful transition. Uh, he wants West Virginia to keep moving forward. Uh, Patrick is our guy. We're going to do everything we can between now and January to make him successful. And then as treasurer, I'll do everything after January to, to make him successful. So I'll tell him I'll help him as much as he wants or as little as he wants. So we're, we're very, very, we're very um, enthused about the transition. We think it's going to be a smooth transition. Uh, Patrick has been um, you know, under the dome since 2012. He knows how it works. He knows what he wants to do. 
at some point he's going to share with us um, the things that we need to do to give him that jump start, um, and, and we'll do that. In the interim, as Governor Justice reminds me, his, he was elected for four years, not three and a half years. He wants yeah. us to run at the finish line. He wants us to do a lot of good things that not only will help West Virginia, but also put Patrick in a position to be, be successful. Uh, we want him to be our, our second in a row um, world-class governor. We think he will be. We're going to do everything we can to put him in that position and help him get there. Well, Larry, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We are up against a hard break, and uh, you are listening to WRNR and TV 10.